Uh, Welcome no. everybody. Um, good evening. Um, I'll be handing over to Sally, uh, our guest speaker, to talk about the ice ages very soon. Just before I do that, I'd like to um, give a little bit of a call out and plug for CPRE, the countryside charity. If you'd like to help us um, out, protect the help us by protecting the countryside, please visit our website. Member, you can do that by visiting www.cpre.org.uk forward slash get dash involved. Um, to find out how you can donate to our local branch, you can visit um, justgiving.com forward slash CPRE Shropshire. And to find more information on our projects involving our very successful Hedro project and to find uh, the video of Sally's last talk, which was called The Geology of Shropshire, please visit our local website, which is cpreshropshire.org.uk. Um, you can catch us at some upcoming events, namely the Clun Green Man, which is on the 2nd of May, the Regenerative Farming Conference that's on the 6th of May, uh, in Norbury Village Hall um, and the Livishall Fate in June uh, the, and the um, Green Fair in Ludlow all in July, just to name a few. Um, if you've got any questions on any of that that I've just mentioned, uh, or you'd like to find out a bit more about how you can get involved with CPRE Shropshire, please contact us at admin at cpreshropshire.org.uk or you can give us a call on 01574 uh, 01 Five four seven five two eight five four six. But don't worry if you didn't catch that because all this will be posted in the chat as we go along. So without further ado, I'm going to shut up and I'm going to hand over to our fantastic speaker, Sally. Well, thank you, Connor, oh, for no, that. Everyone. Oh, share screen. Share screen. Well, let me share screen. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Right, I'm still there. Thank you very much, Connor, uh, and welcome everybody to this uh, follow-up talk uh, exactly a year after I gave my last talk on the geological history of Shropshire, which uh, did last for rather a long time because I had to get through about 4.5 billion years, which is a long time to cram into even two hours. Well, so you'll be glad to hear that tonight I only have to get through about two million years, uh, which is uh, considerably more um, doable. And I've already had a little uh, note from our esteemed heritage person on CPRE, who inquires why I am dressed in this um, outfit. It's because, of course, the, the weather has turned somewhat inclement and we appear to be heading into the next ice age already, um, which I've been expecting for some time. So as I'm actually at my daughter's house uh, in Wales, we've had to travel a mile or two, and I thought I'd better dress up and keep myself warm. But now I will reveal my true self, because it's quite warm in here, uh, and I will proceed to talk about the ice age in Shropshire particularly the last ice age. Um, okay, Charles, first, first slide, please. Oops. Right. Um, well, you will all recognize these places and you also know that they are all well-known tourist destinations in the county and you'll probably when you think about realize that none of them would be here if it weren't for the uh, series of ice ages in the Quaternary in the last um, two million years. At the top, we have the Mere at Ellesmere, which is one of a number of meres which were formed um, in the ice age by the residue from, um, the, as the ice retreated, leaving lumps of ice uh, stranded, these developed into what we call kettle holes. And these were particularly large ones around Ellesmere because we had the conjunction of two ice sheets um, that uh, co conjoined really at Ellesmere. And, and so, as I'm sure you all know, there are a lot of very striking Ice Age features in this area. So, this has left us with a very beautiful mirror, 
a very well-known tourist attraction. On the left, we have the equally famous um, Osmond's Tree Hill Fort, which we are fiercely defending here in Osmond's Tree um, from development. And luckily, we've just heard that uh, the latest uh, application to build houses in the um, Kirtledge has been refused, which is yeah, a great sight. Oh, it's been withdrawn, sorry. Oh, no, no, it no it's been yeah. refused. Yeah. Um, and the, the, um, the hill fort is actually built on one of the lateral moraines. Um, a large glacier ploughed its way down the um, Kariog Valley. And when it reached the North Shropshire Plain, it turned right, fanned out, and proceeded to uh, move in a southerly direction, um, leaving these lateral moraines. And there is a line of low hills parallel to the edge of the Oswestry Hills, upon one of which is built the, um, the, the hill fort. Um, it's not particularly stable land, but it's, it's well drained because it's made of, of uh, um, glacial till, gla boulder clay really, and, um, and gravel, so it was probably quite permeable, kept dry, kept people dry. Then of course the famous Iron Bridge um, Tell uh, uh, Iron Bridge Bridge over the Iron Bridge Gorge, which itself was formed um, from the ice melting um, after the, uh, the the last series of ice ages. To the right, uh, the slightly tipped picture, and this is the um, Wixell Moss, which is the large moss in North Shropshire, which is also in a very large kettle hole. Uh, which is which has gradually filled up with vegetation and peat over centuries uh, and turned into this vast and unique um, moss, as, it, as it's called in this part of the world, the third largest in England of raised peat moss and a very, very important um, site of special scientific interest for, for its um, vegetation and it, and its insect life, fiercely guarded by the, um, the naturalists. Bottom left, you see an image of the famous Long Mind, and you'll see these rounded batches, they're called, which probably started life as narrow river valleys, but when the ice rolled over the Long Mind, they smoothed it over and shaped it into this, these rather nice, um, uh, well, well, shapely batches, we call them, um, which is also a great tourist attraction. And on the bottom right, of course, we have the Sniper Stones, which uh, is the second tallest hill in, in Shropshire, and probably for some time poked above the ice level, which was at times well over a thousand feet high, almost 2000 feet unimaginably vast ice, ice sheets. And this, of course, freezed and thawed every time, um, every night probably, but uh, particularly in the winter. And the, 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 the fluids um, penetrated this hard quartzite, froze, expanded and shattered them. Uh, and you see the shattered rock and the, um, the scree below and we'll find scree on most of the high hills in Shropshire from the same process. Certainly on the Clee Hills, there are signs of frost shattering. And it also mm -hmm. forms a sort of soil called head, about which more later. Next, please. Mm. Oh, no. oh, there, we there we are, right. Um, now, I don't know how many people actually attended my lecture last year, uh, which took us right through from the Precambrian up to the age of the last solid rocks in Shropshire, which was in the, um, the early Jurassic, the Liassic time, about 200, 180 million years ago, this, this blue area uh, around Priest. Um, and, and I'll just remind you, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, but um, 
we have a wonderfully varied selection of rocks in, in Shropshire, bedrock that is, underlying what later was covered by the glacial uh, sediments. Um, the, the top half of the county is essentially composed of Triassic sandstones, very soft sandstones that were laid down uh, at a time when we were in um, a hot desert and all the continents of the world were joined together as Pangaea. So these sediments are very soft and um, quite deep and they grade into mudstones and um, salt deposits as you go further north into, into Cheshire, which are the remains of a, an inland sea called the Zeichstein Sea that poked its way into this, um, this trough, which was formed when the ground extended um, at, at a certain era in geological time. South of that, of course, we have the Shropshire Hills, which um, are aligned along the, the famous Church Stretton Fault and the Pontsford Lindley Fault next to it, um, mainly composed of very hard, very old rocks of varying times of various ages, but pretty resistant to erosion. So prior to the, the Ice Age, they would have been a little bit higher, but essentially that landscape would have been much the same as it is now. And the bottom right, we have Craven Arms, I'm sorry, we have the, the Clee Hills, which are formed from old red sandstone, which is also a sandstone, but a much older sandstone than the Triassic sandstones. Um, these were laid down in the Devonian era um, when um, this part, the, the crust bearing these rocks was south of the equator. You will remember that the, the rocks um, that form Shropshire have travelled right from the, the practically the South Pole all the way up to where we are today at 52 degrees north, uh, passing through a lot of climatic regions um, with varying temperatures. Uh, which I'll tell you about in a little while. Um, and um, yes, and in, in among all the movement, the world has experienced five, at least five ice ages. Um, and after the, uh, after the, um, the last solid rocks were laid down, it's a bit of a mystery. We don't really know what happened in Shropshire because all the rocks are missing. And the reason they're missing is that um, early in what we call the tertiary era, after the Jurassic and Cretaceous era, um, the Northwest of what the combined Britain, when it had combined with the rocks that were carried by a different uh, route to, to join up with, with the South was uplifted and uh, the North Atlantic began to open, which tipped the whole island, uh, the Northwest rising, the Southeast dropping. And as you see from the map of the whole of the geology of the whole of Britain, which are probably familiar, we have these um, oblique lines which show where erosion occurred. And it's pretty certain that the chalk, which is the light green, did uh, was laid down in the Cretaceous era, did go all over the whole of Britain, because we find little remnants in, um, in northwest Scotland overlined by lava, um, which it indicates it's quite likely these rocks covered the whole country. Likewise, the Jurassic rock, rocks, um, which pre predate that, the, 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 the Cotswold stones were, were everywhere. And in fact, um, the, the glaciers that came down the Irish Sea dredged up rocks, which um, you can actually see on the beach um, at a place called Tom Vanny near Tawin. You will find Jurassic rocks, which have been dredged up by the ice, um, the ice flows and dumped on the beach. And I have some myself. So it's a wonderful place to go and see Ice Age structures at Tom Vanny. There's a little halt on the railway if you want to get there. So 
Next, please, Charles. No, I'm going on to that. Yeah. Let's put it on the next one. Right. Just quickly, I'm going to run through these images of what Shropshire would have looked like in these eras to give you an idea of the variable temperatures we will have, we would have endured. Uh, this is largely because we were moving through the latitudes um, from the deep south uh, in the early Precambrian um, up to where we are in the temperate climates. But I like these pictures. So I'm going to show you again. You might have seen them. This is our image of the two lines of volcanoes um, either side of the Ponsford Lindley and um, Shetland Fault. Uh, with what life here is quite primitive, these things are called traumatolites, the unicellular early life that um, you can still find in Australia actually, beginning to produce oxygen. Um, and the, the first ice age uh, occurred because of the, 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 the changes in the composition of uh, the gases in the atmosphere after early life began um, in the form of cyanobacteria. Next, please. Um, here we are in the Cambrian. This is when, after the first large, large ice age, which I'll talk about in a minute, the, there was a huge explosion of multicellular life, very peculiar life, uh, which developed worldwide, worldwide. You've probably heard of the Burgess Shale in Canada. And there's an equally bizarre set of fossils in South West China from this era, um, absolute proliferation of life in fairly fairly cool climates in this area, but um, uh, warm enough to support life. And we have a few Cambrian rock, rock, uh, fossils in Shropshire, notably trilobites um, in the um, Church Stretton Valley. Next one. Um, here we have the Ordovician. This was an era of great volcanoes. Um, and again, there was another ice age in this time, we thought to be caused by the eruption of multiple volcanoes um, when um, tectonics was, was in full flow, which blocked out sunshine, sunlight, and cooled the atmosphere generally for a while. So this was not quite such a warm era. As you say, there were ice ages and a lot of life that had evolved that far went extinct. Next, please. Next, we have the Silurian. Now, this is a different matter. Shallow seas, we'd moved up, this piece of the crust had moved up into warmer climes, um, probably where Oh, South Africa is at the moment, sort of Mediterranean climates, very shallow seas, life absolutely flourished. And this is what eventually ended up as Wenlock Edge, very well known. But the climate then was, was lovely and warm and balmy in general. Next one. Then we moved into Devonian, which is when the old red sandstone was formed. And this was essentially very dry very um, hot, desert-like, um, and um, land life began to proliferate. And this was the era when land plants began to arrive. So here we have life coming out of the sea, essentially. Before this, most life was in water, and uh, reptiles are beginning to develop legs and uh, Things were getting rather warm, really. Okay. Carboniferous, hot and steamy. We were at the equator at this time, so it was a very hot climate, climate and proliferate um, these Lycopodia coal forests proliferated all over the place in our neck of the woods, which gave rise to our coal seams. Next, yeah. Um, and the Permian. Well, at this point, the um, continents had coalesced to form Pangaea, and it was still a fairly, a, a, a fairly tropical climate, but the large reptiles were evolving, as you see. 
And then you have the Triassic, which was desert-like, which is what gave rise to the whole of North Shropshire. Um, early dinosaurs had evolved and the climate was hot, uh, very dry, because we're in the middle, right in the middle of a huge continent. Next. And then the Jurassic, it, again, we'd moved a little bit further north and it was not quite such a hot climate and all sorts of life had evolved. And then we come to a crashing end in Shropshire until, well, we have this, this gap, um, things happening around the earth which might explain what happened. There was a large ocean to the side of Pangaea which closed and caused the uplifting of the Himalayas and the Alps, long line of mountains, and Shropshire rocks started to fold. So we, um, we think this affected climate because new rocks forming and eroding tends to absorb carbon dioxide. There was also violent volcanism, as I've mentioned, in the North Atlantic. Um, and there was a mass extinction at the end of the Cretaceous, where the dinosaurs all died out. And then the large mammals started to evolve. So there was a lot happening. We just don't know exactly what was happening in Shropshire until next, um, the ice ages occurred. So here we have the sort of animals that have bounded towards the end of the ice ages, let's say. The famous mammoths is a woolly rhinoceros, quite a lot of deer like beasts lions, um, horses, early horses. So this, so from about 70,000 years ago to 10,000 years ago, latterly uh, in the, the Quetuot Ternary period, three at least very, very cold eras, um, what we call the Anglian, which was the largest ice cap, followed by the Wollstonian, and the last ice was the Devensian, uh, about which we know most because each ice age tended to obliterate most of the evidence from previous ice ages. Yes, yeah, next please, yeah. So we have these five known ice ages of the earth. The Huronium, which is the first one, was very, very early life only unicellular and, and probably formed a snowball earth, that the earth was totally covered in ice for many, many thousands of years. Um, as you see, um, this was coincident to what they call this great oxygenation event, when early bacteria flourished and began to exude oxygen, which reacted with methane uh, to form water and CO2. So the level of CO2 went up, but was eaten by the new continental crust, um, which, which tends to absorb CO2. Um, so the days were much shorter at this time, and there was low luminosity, as we call it. So there were low temperatures worldwide. And um, we do know that these, uh, this, this ice age occurred in Great Britain because um, deposits have been found on the Isle of Islay, which indicate there was cold temperature. Then there was a bit of a gap till the, towards the end of the Precambrian era, 720 to 635 million years ago. No, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, this just predated the explosion of multicellular cellular life in the Ediacaran era. Um, there were two stages to this, this great, this ice age, um, when temperatures were very, very low. And this is thought to have been brought about by volcanism when the breakup of another supercontinent, Rodinia, happened. Again, widespread and snowball earth. So anyone traveling in space at this time would have just seen a big white ball, possibly mushy ice at the equators, but pretty lifeless place. 
the following two ice ages were not quite so widespread, but again caused by volcanism and weathering of new mountain ranges. And it, evidence has been found in Africa and Saudi Arabia when these were at the poles and in Southwest South America, why it's known as the Andean Saharan, um, between the Ordovician and Silurian eras. So not particularly evident in Shropshire. And Karoo, the next one, um, happened while Pangaea was, was, was uh, reigning supreme. Um, with this large land mass and the closure of oceans, which disrupted warm water currents. Land plants were evolved in the Devonian era, rising oxygen levels and dropping CO2 levels. So ice caps developed. Uh, and in every case ice caps developed, they were accelerated by what we call the albedo effect, which is when sunlight reflects off ice, it tends to accelerate the, the it, it, that lowers the temperature basically because the the earth isn't absorbing this the energy from the sun the reason why we wear white clothes and hot climates so there we are after the end of the Karoo the next the next big ice age and the latest one is the, in the quaternary um, which is the ongoing ice age we are officially still in this ice age um, which comes and goes and has had about 17 cycles between 2.4 million years ago and 11,500 years ago ongoing. And this is the one that has affected the Shropshire landscape and uh, determined by what we call Milankovitch cycles. Next, please. So here we see these, this is the latest um, temperature changes. And between each bout of very, very cold weather, you actually got quite warm weather at times before this, in fact, um, before the beginning of the Devensian, it got very, very warm. So at times, Britain was actually warmer than it is today uh, and hosted all sorts of uh, exotic uh, tropical animals, really. We had uh, you probably heard that when they dug up Trafalgar Square some years ago, they found the bones of elephants, saber-toothed tigers, um, hippopotamuses. So this showed that during these long periods of time, there were what they call stadials and interstadials. So it, it's not uh, one cold period, but uh, multiple. Next, yes. Right, there's a lot of reasons for climate change, and I won't go into detail of this because it's all rather tedious for you. This is not meant to be a science lecture, but these are some of the reasons why the climate change is, it's not just CO2, but um, uh, as you see, there are solar cycles um, with brightening and dimming of the sun. Um, and it's thought that in six between 1645 and 1715 the sun actually dimmed causing the mini ice age which um of course you remember seeing pictures of people skating on the river thames in london volcanism a very big one throws up a lot of ash blocks the sunlight from the earth sends out toxic sulfurous fruit fumes uh, causes general cooling um, and even, you know, big eruptions within recent history have cooled the world temperature. Krakatoa, for instance, and the Ilopango in El Salvador dropped the world temperatures for several years. Milankovitch cycles, which are basically orbital wallet wobbles. I'll tell you a little bit about, more about that in a minute. The, young, the sun was very faint in its early days. So uh, CO2 level fluctuation is a greenhouse gas which uh, acts like the roof of a greenhouse essentially, which we all know about. Plate tectonics had a big effect on climate because uh, changes the um, basically the configuration of land masses. 
um, and these can have a very great effect on things like ocean circulation, particularly when North and South, North America and South America joined up. It stopped the circulation of uh, ocean currents right around the Earth and instigated the start of the um, Gulf Stream. And also when Antarctica broke away from the bottom end of South America, it allowed currents to go right round uh, Antarctica, uh, cutting it off from the rest of the world uh, and allowed ice sheets to develop, covering the whole of Antarctica. Asteroid impacts, um, these are thought to have had some effect on climate. The vast one at the end of the um, Cretaceous killed off the dinosaurs actually produced warming for some hundreds of years because it was so vast and, and so much um, ash was thrown up and debris. But um, many other ancient craters have been found and not thought to affect climate particularly. Evolution, the evolution of cyanobacteria, land plants, all affect the gases in the climate. And large igneous provinces, this is times when large amounts of lava have been exuded, um, particularly in Siberia, in Northwest America. Um, and so in some cases actually ignited coal, as you see the Siberian coal, when Siberian lava erupted, produced up to five to seven degrees of warming for many, many years. Um, and there were thermal maximums because methane in the Atlantic Ocean uh, actually was cooking and warming the, um, more relatively recently warming the climate. So there are other reasons, but I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about those. Oh, what have I done there? I don't know, Charles. Is that evident to other people? I can't hear. Come on. I don't know what I've done there. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, I thought I didn't realize my. Uh, I was muted, yeah, I was going to say. Technical again. hitch here, I'm sorry. Sorry, I was talking away and I didn't realize to start mute. Sorry. Where were we? I haven't got that for you. Slideshow. Try the slide. My apologies. No, this, this was stop. tactical, everyone. This was very tactical, actually, because we're talking about the Ice Ages, so we're behaving as if we are in the Ice Ages and just learning about technology now. Um, okay. So this, this was all intentional. Oh, good. I've probably sent everyone to sleep now with the, with the bits of science, but Milankovitch cycles are very important. Um, the theory of the Earth's solar input and its climate are affected by fluctuations in the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. And this was proposed by a, a, a Scott scientist, James Kroll, in about 1875, and revived and developed by a Serbian geophysicist, Milutin Milankovic, in the 1920s. Um, the Earth's orbit around the sun is elliptical, if you looked at number two, orbital eccentricity, with the sun as a focus offset from the ellipse. When the orbit is nearly circular, the amount of radiation varies little around the annual orbit, but when the orbit is more elliptical, there is a 23% difference in solar radiation between the Earth's closest approach, which is known as the perihelion and the furthest approach, the aphelion to the sun. So this varies cyclically over two periods, one of which is 413 kilo years and one averaging 100 kilo years, that's thousand years. Um, 
It also depends on whether the Earth's northern or southern pole is tilted towards the sun. See number one, axial tilt. And this varies by more than two degrees on a 41,000 year cycle. And also the Earth's rotational axis and the axis of its orbital ellipse rotates around the normal to the orbital plane. This is known as axial precession with a period of about 22,000 years. So these three factors cause these various cyclical changes in the amount of radiation reaching the Earth. And if they're all added together, as Milankovitch realized, you get these very cyclical changes in the overall heat distributed in the Earth. And these actually coincide very neatly with the, uh, the ice ages. So it's, it's rather... Um, rather clever and it's also we can predict in the future when we are likely to get ice ages although of course at the moment human human induced co2 is rather queering the pitch so it's not certain but the likelihood is that we will go back into more ice ages in due course oh dear i'll have to talk among myself a little bit more i'm afraid because we're technically in trouble We've got sending for our technical. Oh dear. Apologies, everyone. We'll we're just sorry, trying to sorry about this. get the screen back on. It's not a problem. Are there any questions at this stage? I, yes, see. any questions? Have we got any in the chat box? No, but I see a couple have unmuted themselves, so I wasn't sure whether oh, they're yes, okay. So if you are unmuted, just fire away with any questions. Sally, so Mike Robbins here. Um, just out of interest, is there any evidence that the more recent ice ages had any effect on the political state of the world? On the political? Yes, in the sense that um, the Mont Dominion, uh, that was the time when uh, we had the problems for Charles's, King Charles's and uh, Oliver Cromwell, etc. I was just wondering whether perhaps it caused some sort of uh, impact on the political status, et cetera, et cetera. Is there any evidence to suggest that? Well, Mike, I'm not a historian. I'm afraid I, I gave up history when I was about 13 <laughs> uh, and I have absolutely no idea, but I would imagine quite likely, yes, in the same way perhaps that droughts now are causing migrations maybe in when it got particularly cold i'm sure there was more plague around illness um but as for the politics um i don't know i really can't say i think you need a historian there must be a historian among the audience somewhere are we back on yeah we're back on <laughs> we're back on track now so we'll I carry on technical support from downstairs <laughs> mike i'll come back to you on that one maybe i'll do some research or maybe you could do some research but uh, it's not my main topic i'm afraid so charles is go on carry yeah, on carry on next please next please he's back on but he's right during during the last ice age carry on carry on oh gosh he's having a cardiac event i think um this is the maximal extent of the very last ice age, the one that has left most evidence in Shropshire, the Defensium, which uh, spanned 70,000 to 10,000 years ago. Next, please. Yeah. Uh, and here we have uh, a diagram of what happened. Now, I'll have to say that I do. Um, owe a lot to our local Ice Age expert, David Pannett, who is a retired lecturer at West Preston Monford Field Centre, who's done a lot of research on, um, the, on the Ice Age, particularly in his area around Montford. Um, and he has done some of these diagrams for me. Um, no, not for you, you no, filched no, no. from him. I've, I've filched them, yes, yeah. <laughs> Um, here we have the, 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 the ice age that came furthest south, the Anglian glaciation, um, about maximum about 450,000 years ago. 
reached as far south as from the Thames to the Bristol Channel, following the South Wales coast roughly. Um, this was the, the, the largest um, ice, the, the furthest south ice, ice came. And below that has always been ice free. And the Anglican followed the north coast of Devon right down as far as the Scilly Islands. Um, there's evidence on the north coast of the Scillies of the ice. And a huge lobe came down through the Irish Sea. And we know this from deep sea sediments. And uh, we know there was moraine at the very south around the south of the Bristol Channel um, from dredgings of uh, erratic boulders dropped into the sea. And this, this ice age actually altered the course of the of the Thames, which prior to that uh, flowed much further north. It came out into the North Sea somewhere around Felixstowe. Uh, and, uh, and, and earlier than this, the Thames actually drained the Welsh mountains. There was no Severn, um, but that drainage changed partly due before this, due to this tipping of the, of the um, of the country, but uh, the, the, the ice blocked the outflow and pushed the, the Thames further south. Um, and then the, as you see, the Devensian glaciation didn't reach nearly as far south as the Angli Anglian, but resulted from ice caps developing over, over the center of Scotland, the Southern Uplands, the Lake District, and North Wales, each had their own ice cap. And if you sort of imagine, I want you to use imagination a lot here. Imagine most people on this um, call will, will have been around in 1963 and remember that dreadful winter. Now imagine that every winter, after a while, the snow never melts on the, on the highlands just compacts into snow, into ice, I mean. And after some time, the ice begins to move. It begins to flow very, very slowly, but moves downhill, moves uphill, in fact, as well. But these years and years and years of uh, snowy conditions soon give way to these rivers of ice which tend to form big lobes and move out from the hills out into these lowland areas. And this is the maximum um, extent of the latest ice age, so the Devensian, which uh, lasted until over about 10,000 years ago. Next thing. Yeah. And this is Shropshire before the ice age the latest ice age. Now, as you see, the River Severn actually flowed out into the Irish Sea, um, just kept flowing north along under the under the Oswestry Hills and to the east of the Cambrian Mountains. And the river that is now flowing west, no, flowing east through Shrewsbury, probably flowed west into this uh, ancient River Seven D catchment. In the south, the the River Team flowed directly south. It didn't go through the Downton Gorge. We're coming out of the county now, but the Team here flowed down to the to the Y catchment directly south. There was quite a difference, and absolutely no sign of the the Seven Gorge to the east of the Clee Hills. Nothing there at all. Uh, further south, there would have been drainage down towards the Bristol Channel, but the drainage was quite diff different. Um, okay, now I had a lot of fun with the next few slides. Um, figuring out how I could model the, the Ice Age in Shropshire, and I, it was suggested to me that I should make some Play-Doh, which I haven't done since my children were young. So, many years ago now. But indeed, I decided I would have a go at making Play-Doh, uh, um, which is very simple. And indeed, it was perfect for making pseudo ice, ice flows. So 
Here we see the ice at its maximum in Shropshire, covering the whole of the north of the county. However, I want to distinguish it from the Welsh ice, so I found some um, some sort of cheese wax, the red cheese wax from Baby Bells, and melted it over the top of the of the um, uh, ice cap here. So this shows where ice flowing out from the ice caps been formed on Snowdonia met a river of ice coming down over the Irish Sea uh, into the Cheshire Plain and down into Shropshire. And the line of demarcation is somewhere between Ellesmere and Shrewsbury, and now forms a very prominent ridge through Cockshut and that, that way, which is where the two ice flows met. In the south, you see there are fingers pointing below the um, South Shropshire Hills um, here. Uh, and they blocked the drainage of rivers um, such as the, the upper reaches of the Oni were blocked. So this is how things were. But Wenlock Edge was not covered in, in, in ice, as far as we know. Corved Vale doesn't have ice um, deposits in it. Um, and the tops of the Long Mind and the Stiper Stones were probably free of, free of ice much of the time. But bear in mind, these things came and went and came and went and over many thousands of years. So it wasn't a simple picture, it's impossible. I can't do moving images, but this is the best I can manage. Next, please. Um, as the ice began to retreat, and when I say retreat, it doesn't actually retreat, it just, just the edge of the ice sheet uh, goes gradually further, further north, leaving debris at the end that it's been carrying it's plucked things up from the bedrock an awful lot of water drained from the edges of the ice sheets forming these great big lakes and this one that uh, Charles is pointing out now um, is where the Weald Moors are now north of Telford that area Aqualate if you know Aqualate just into Staffordshire east of Newport. These areas are, are very low and boggy. Um, to the west we have a big lake developing really where Lake Melverley developed a few weeks ago with the giant floods between the Brython Hills and uh, Nest Cliff. Uh, this all filled up with water. Further south we have another lake developing um, south of Montgomery, um, in the what's now the Camrad Valley, that was a great big, big lake. And further, much further south, a huge lake developed at um, Wigmore, uh, west of Ludlow. Um, and these couldn't drain because they were blocked by ice. Next, please. Now, then, it was discovered a few years ago that. If below the middle of Shropshire there is a large trough and it's believed that um, underneath the ice cap a river, rivers developed under pressure which pushed east as the, as the ice uh, covered them in the meltwaters uh, going down to below sea level in fact uh, and it is now thought that the theory that Lake Lapworth which was originally thought these great big lakes grew so large that they overtopped the coal um, at Ironbridge is now discredited and it's thought the um, Ironbridge Gorge was caused by this trough of water under pressure moving from the west to the east and breaking through the soft rocks around, around Ironbridge. Um, Likewise, we have in the southwest the the blockage here of um, the the Oni River reversed the flow in the Camlad and forced the this this water to find another way out, um, and it broke through. Now, many of you will 
possibly have, like me, originally wondered what this great gorge north of Church Stoke is, Marrington Dingle, very deep, very unexpected, deep gorge-like valley heading north towards um, the Wortham Valley. This, in fact, is also a glacial outflow valley. So the waters poured, found their way north from the, um, the, this great lake uh, and disgorged out into the Severn. The Severn was blocked by the ice further north, the old Severn, uh, and decided to turn east uh, and join, join the waters in this deep trough forming the, the seven as we know it. Yvonne. So there is the next, the next phase. We now have a bit of a mess. And anybody who's been and seen old glaciers, uh, perhaps in the Alps or in New Zealand or somewhere, will know that actually there's an awful lot of debris left when a glacier retreat, retreats or an ice cap retreat, say in Iceland, there's nothing but masses of gravel and sand and general mess and a lot of water and braided rivers. And this is the stage we have here. Um, the waters are now flowing through the, the gap. I haven't done it very well there, but um, it's dumped an awful lot of gravel and sand in the um, retreating glacier areas. Next one. That's a bit fuzzy, but on this one, you can now see that the, uh, the Severn flows through Ironbridge Gorge and right down the gorge by Bridge North. A lot of so a soft Triassic sandstones easily, easily gouged out by the Proto Severn, which now no longer flows out of the Irish Sea, but uh, makes its way south to the the set the the seven of the Bristol Channel to become the longest river in British Isles, and actually in sorry in Great Britain not there's I think the Shannon's longer, but again you see a lot of debris to the west. You have um, the Welsh Welsh ice debris, which is mostly shales and um, slates and some volcanics. To the east you have the Triassic sandstone, which have been gouged up, and erratic boulders from as far away as uh, the lowlands of Scotland. Next, please. And finally, after the Ice Ages, vegetation began to uh, grow. So we have the beginnings of uh, birch forests. Um, down we've seen the beginnings of the, the forest um, of what's it called? The wire forest here and forests around where Telford is. Uh, and a, a, a rather new landscape. But there's still a lot of glacial debris left in North Shropshire, uh, which lingered for many hundreds of years, I'm sure, forming these great kettle holes and uh, meres and mosses. Okay, and this is what you're left with after the ice has retreated completely. Again, I credit this uh, to David Panett and shows the features which we can all go and see and are very obvious to many with the right, the right eye on. Um, in the north of uh, the whole of the Shropshire Plain, anyone driving around there will know that it's like permanent switchbacks, the road coming out of Shropshire, and uh, sorry, of Shrewsbury towards um, Beaumere Heath, for instance, you're, it almost makes you seasick, you're going up and down. So the, the and this is because of the unevenness of the, the glacial till in these areas. Uh, here we have the, the lakes have developed in um, the Ellesmere area where the two ice streams had met and dumped all their rubbish. Around uh, Whitchurch you have moraines which tend to be arc-shaped um, and there's a, a large moraine 
stream south of Wixell Moss, which probably held back the ice there as it was melting. Um, and south of Shrewsbury, you'll see a line of black dots here. This is what we call an esker, which I'll explain in a, in a minute, which are a long line of line ridge. Uh, and, and these gorges, of course, have formed. And um, there's another gorge. This is the Marrington Gorge over where the Camlad fall, falls th th there. So have a little look at this. But all these features are fairly evident on the ground when you get your eye in. And I always feel driving across North Shropshire that you're on a sort of tablecloth. And at any minute you could, or a sponge, you can be let down into a hole because it's absolutely riddled with kettle holes, as you probably know. Um, as you drive towards the west and you hit the Dee Valley, you suddenly go down a great big uh, escarpment, really, at the edge here, which is where the ice has been gouged out, probably by the rivers later on. So it's a very, very characteristic landscape. And now, Deep breath, it gets a bit easier. We'll have a little look at the, the features. Oh, yes, I had to put this picture in because it's a, again credited to David Panett, his visualization of what the Berwyn Mountains were like in the Ice Age. You've got Moersich and Cader Berwyn here, and a glacier coming down towards Pistoli Rider with its outwash channels. Um, so that's his visualization. And it's very easy to see when you climb up. You've probably all climbed up to the top of Cader Berwyn. Um, these glacial features are very obvious. Right, next, please. Yeah. OK, let's just talk about what we can see around Shropshire. And I'm sure everybody's aware of these erratic rocks which litter the county, which have been carried by the ice incredible distances in some cases and it's it's amazing as as i said as an ice flow travels across a landscape it plucks up the rocks from underneath and transports them very very slowly but very long distances this is the bell stone which sits outside the library in um in shrewsbury well known to charles darwin who didn't know what they were in his early days, but it so happened that his lifetime coincided with that of Louis Agassiz, who was a Swiss geologist who realized that Britain had been covered in ice and debunked the biblical um, doctrine that the earth was 4,000 years old. And of course, by the end of his life, Charles Darwin had realized why the bellstone was there, which is made of granite. Um, it had come down from the north. These, these boulders here sit at the entrance to the Tudor Griffiths quarry at um, Wood, Wood, Wood Lane, Wood Lane near Ellesmere, very large. This one, as you turn in, if you fill up your car at the Nescliffe Bypass, there's a large erratic sitting on the side here. And these are these are two lumps of granite. To the left is a piece I picked up down in Cornwall last year. As you see, this is just raw granite from somewhere near um, Red Ruth, I think it was. To the right is a piece I picked up recently at Condover. Exactly the same rock, both granite, um, but the one on the right has been transported probably down from either the Lake District or the Southern Uplands, rolled around, smashed about, and has been well rounded. I see that's the effect of the ice on granite. And here's one sitting by the road in Nuckin. And I'm sure everybody, when you go for a walk, perhaps next time you go for a walk in the countryside or near a ploughed field or um, area, do pick up the rocks and have a good look at them because you'll find extraordinary variation in, in the type of rocks. Uh, it'd be quite nice to somehow log what kind of rock, rocks you found and let us know. Um, you know, you could let your CPRE website know 
what you found so we could actually map uh, a little bit more about where the ice has come from. Um, if you find Welsh rocks further east than, uh, than, than Ellesmere, um, it would be rather interesting because as I, I try as I might, I can't find a great deal of research about the movement of ice. It's all very conjectural. Um, it's surprising how little research has actually been done, as far as I can see. So there we are. Now, these things, eskers, very interesting glacial features. Eskers form underneath ice flows, um, glaciers, when rivers form of meltwater at the base of a glacier, and the rivers carry sediment, they carry gravel and sands, and when the, um, when the glacier retreats, it leaves a snake-like river um, of these sediments, marking where the subglacial rivers were. And we're lucky enough in Shropshire to, to have several of these eskers the most uh, dramatic of which is here at Dorrington. Um, it stretches for about four miles, um, parallel, the sub parallel to the A49, south of Baston Hill, south of Lithe Hill, the very definite snake-like, um, quite, uh, quite prominent ridge, just isolated. When it, hit, it crosses the A49, uh, just north of Dorrington, where you go over a rise, and at Dorrington it's, it's actually being quarried, so they're, they're taking it away, but it's a jolly good walk. If you take the, the turning, uh, as you're going south, turn right towards Stapleton, which is at the bottom here, and halfway along you'll find the road goes over a hump, and if you park there, you can see the, the Esker very clearly, it's worth getting out of the car and walking along the top and having a good look because it's it's really fascinating. Stands out above the fields, probably 50, 50 or 60 feet, um, 100 yards wide, really very prominent. There's another esker further east, which is actually on this slide as well, adjacent to a large quarry south of Condover where the glacial sands are being quarried um, in great amounts. And at the bottom, Aqualate Mere, again, it's just into Shropshire, but the Staffordshire, Staffordshire sorry. Um, the north of Aqualate Mere, there's a long snaky ridge, which is another esker. It's all tree covered, so it's not quite so obvious, but it is indeed a, an esker. And I've, I took a photograph of what the ground was like halfway up this esker, and you can see it's just composed of a large number of cobbles and uh, gravels uh, of, of various provenances. Fascinating eskers, that is. Moraines, I'm sure we're all familiar with moraine. Um, you have various types of moraine. You've got medial moraine running down the middle of a, a glacier. Uh, and lateral moraines, which is the material dumped at the sides as a glacier moves. Uh, and as they say, the Shropshire's got lateral moraine in the form of the um, hill fort in Oswestry, as I've already pointed out. Terminal moraine, well, the end of any glacier looks like a kind of, oh, I don't know, junkyard, a heap of rubble, often many miles of it. Um, and then years and years later, it, 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 it's, um, oh, it, it can be exploited as um, building materials. This is, this is the, um, the um, Tudor Griffiths quarries at uh, Wood Lane, where there's a nature reserve actually in the excavated parts of it, which have been flooded and a very good bird reserve. But they're still busy digging out lots and lots and lots of sand from, from this uh, moraine dump, really. Right, drumlins and canes. These are glacial features which um, you do find in Shropshire. They're a little bit 
less well defined than these two pictures which have come from Scotland, I think. But a drumlin is a feature that lines up with the flow of the ice in the same direction. And in Scotland, there are huge areas of drumlin fields. And they take this form of having a blunt end and a sharp end. And if you imagine the, the ice flowing from the left to the right, um, it will uh, encounter some object, um, flows over it, and then dumps its material behind it, forming this very characteristic shape. Um, and uh, we do, I think we can sort of imagine we have some in Shropshire. I, I found somewhere near Tetchel in near Ellesmere that looked a bit drumlin like, but I, I wouldn't swear to it. But we all know that there are huge numbers of humps and bumps, as I call them, all over North Shropshire. Uh, and a cane is, is formed in a slightly different way. Um, I can quote from my notes. Um, they're formed in meltwater um, and develop in depressions in retreating glaciers where gravel accumulates um, in fine to coarse gravel, forming these little hills. Um, so I believe this below it, it actually is a cane in the Church Stretton Valley, where also there are some drumlins between Church Stretton and Old Stretton. Um, so, but um, our esteemed, um, Sarah Jameson, our, me, uh, branch what? Branch our branch manager, I always have to get a title right, um, owns a, a tract of land in the Red Lake Valley, south of Clun. Um, and she has two very prominent little bumpy hills on her field, which she, is, she wonders whether these are drumlins. And I would say from this photograph, which is looking down the Red Lake Valley, they are rather well aligned with the valley, and therefore I think it quite likely that these are drumlins. And if you look below in this picture, we have the right sort of shape, the blunt end and the, the tapering end. So I think we do indeed have, we have our very own CPRE drumlin at New Invention. So we can claim to own a rather nice um, uh, glacial feature. And below, it's not very easy to see, but these are sequences of ice advance around our area where the Tanit emerges from, from the Welsh ice um, and actually altered the course of a river um, by escaping through a gap in the hills just west of um, Lansenfried and Machen which is quite a deep, deep, deep valley. Now, it, now it's, um, um, it crosses the watershed between the Tanat Valley and the Cane Valley, where, where the ice altered the flow of the river. That's a slight digression there, we'll move on then. Okay, kettle holes. I'm sure we're very familiar with these. They're absolutely dotted all over Shropshire. So the top left is the kettle hole, the very kettle hole where the Condover ma mammoths were found. I'm sure you all know the story of the, can the Condover mammoths, which were discovered by a dog walker a number of years ago and really put Shropshire on the map um, because I think four uh, mammoth skeletons were found in, in um, material dredged from this kettle hole at Condover. On the right, of course, we have the large kettle hole at Colmere, all formed by, where, when lumps of ice were left as the glaciers retreated and took a lot longer to melt, during which time sediments accumulated around the lumps of ice, delineating these, um, these sort of holes that filled up. At the bottom row, you see, you've got Wixel Moss, which filled up with 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 uh, peat over the centuries, and we're at the Weald Moor, 
And I would actually um, recommend the Weald Moor for people to go and have a look at, because it's rather fascinating. It's like a little piece of Somerset, Somerset Levels in Shropshire, north of Telford. Um, now it seems to be sown everywhere with miscanthus, this bio grass that presumably gets fed into bio digesters or something. Extremely fertile and very, very black, black soil. And I'm sure peat was extracted from it in vast quantities over the centuries. Right. Okay. Um, now we also have, I was informed by uh, my colleagues in the Mid Wales Geology Group that we have some pingos. Um, I'm not entirely sure how they're formed, but they form in periglacial, that's um, tundras. So probably after the ice had melted, these things grew, really, where lumps of ice again were left. And they formed pressure from below, pushing up the ground into these sort of little volcano type things. I'm not able to um, explain it any better than that. You better look it up on Google, I think, to, to get the right story. But I was told on good authority that we have a field full of pingos down near Albury, near Bishop's Castle in the Camlad Valley. So I, du I duly went down there. Couldn't see anything really. I was later sent this photograph by my colleague from Mid Wales Geology Group which I am told are pingos that have eroded somewhat, but uh, the one to the right, what I did find was this, this circular, more or less circular lake with quite a raised edge with um, lurse like soil, um, blown soil, which I imagine was a, a, an exploded pingo. They've of course all eroded away in the last 10,000 years, but um, I suppose it was worth having a trip down there, but um, I got a nice cup of tea in Bishop's Castle out of it. Okay, glacial outflow channels. Well, these are very, um, very obvious features of the landscape. I told you about this very deep trough, which was discovered using ground sensing materials and, and, and cores. Uh, and this is the glacial trough heading down towards Buildwas. Um, where now the, the, the seven meanders lazily around, uh, but it is a glacial trough. Um, below the Marrington Dingle, as I told you, um, this extraordinarily deep gorge just north of um, Churchstoke. Worth going to have a look. Lovely walks there, beautiful place. Ashes Hollow at All Stretton is probably a glacial outflow um, and of course the Iron Bridge Gorge and I don't think I would have believed all this about water causing these enormous gorges if I hadn't been attending a very interesting series of lectures by a professor at um, Central Washington State University. Absolutely fascinating lectures about the Ice Age in um, Washington State, the North Pacific states of America, where in the last ice age, um, ice lobes protruded across the Canadian border, blocking the outflow of the Columbia River uh, in northern Idaho, which developed into a huge lake called Lake Missoula. Um, and at some point, as the uh, ice retreated, it, this the, the the water broke through the ice barrier in a matter of days it flooded out across what they call the scablands which are a huge area of basalt outflow where um, the, the 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 rocks were well not particularly soft but fairly soft and gouged out these enormous valleys called the coolies and if you look at any map of Washington state, you will see these enormous dry valleys which, through which this water poured and eroded out in a very short time. It was probably carrying a lot of debris, a lot of ice, 
it scoured its way through this country, gathered together again at the bottom uh, and, and formed the Columbia River that pushed its way through the Cascade chain of volcanoes and out, poured out, whoopsie, poured out in the Pacific Ocean. Absolutely amazing. And apparently it kept reforming this great Lake Missoula and then it, uh, flooding again over many centuries. Um, the form of very unique landscape. So it just showed the power of the water, glacial water. Next. Um, now I just want to talk a little bit about the soils that develop from the glaciers. Um, this is a braided river in Iceland. As the glaciers retreating, the, there's a sort of mess of melt water, but it dumps all this gravel and uh, uh, flows of um glacial material all over the landscape there's a lot of it in in the south part of iceland the sand doers um no below go below um we have cousins who farm on the banks of the vernery uh, in maysbrook a couple of sundays ago we were taken in his buggy uh, by our 86 year old cousin who knows the the land absolutely intimately and he assures me here in the banks of the River Morda, we have glacial outwash gravels. Um, I'm sure I believe him. And um, they, they, they're quite, quite evident in lines in the banks. And so the Maysbrook is, is built on a, a ridge, really, where probably a moraine ridge. And there's a slope down into the floodplain of the Vernway. Um, and these are all the gravels, sort of the outwash gravels from the, the Ice Age. Here we have the frost shattered quartzite and screen, the Stiper Stones, which produce vast amounts of these shattered rocks and form soils we call head, um, derived from the fractured rocks. Not particularly um, fertile, in fact, pretty infertile, but enough with the organic material to support heather. Um, bracken and the, the sort of um, plants you see on the Long Mind. Right. Um, boulder clay is the main um, soil that forms the very, very fertile soils of Shropshire. And I went last September with the Mid Wales Geology Group to a very interesting weekend in Suffolk. We we're on the Suffolk coast. And this is actually uh, a section through a cliff uh, along the coast near Lowestoft, showing all the different layers of the glacial Anglian till. Um, as you see, there's a lot of sand here, but overlying the sand, we have the, the boulder clay known as the till, which is clays and, um, uh, uh, and so forth. Here we have the sands at the Hanson Quarry at Condover, vast amounts of sand, a lot of sand at Bildwas, which has been dredged up from these uh, deep um, channels. And here we have the gravels that they sell for I don't know what, but I am about to buy some from Wood Lane, um, which are glacial gravels so exploited. And of course, the peat at Weald Moor developed in, in uh, these glacial holes. And then to our right, there's an interesting type of, uh, of ground called varved clay, uh, which shows where these lakes developed and then drained away, then developed again, forming these parallel sediments. Um, I think this picture comes from near Montford Bridge where um, our good friend David Panett discovered there were a lot of varved clays when they pushed the, the, A5, the new A5 through um, terminal moraines at um, Montford Bridge. So varved clays is new to me. Varved means layered, in fact. Okay. And then close to the heart of CPRE, we have planning issues. So just to conclude really we've got a section through thanks to David Parrott through the landscape at the site of the proposed northwest relief road from which you will see that the northwest relief road will have to 
be engineered into this deep channel filled with very soft, very unstable glacial sands and gravels under the Severn, just where they propose to put these bridges. So the engineers need to pioneer very, very deep piles. And the hydrogeology of this area is very interesting. The, um, I see you here's the Shelton Waterworks here that used to abstract water from the, um, from the River Severn. But um, in fact, these sandstones are an aquifer that carry a lot of water. And as the, the river sort of gives up being a useful source of water, it's now abstracted from the sandstones. And in fact, a big survey a few years ago, the groundwater, North Shropshire Groundwater Survey, has looked, done ice gun cores through. Um, through the North Shropshire Plain, a uh, great distance, which has shown us just how deep the glacial tills are. It's between 10 metres and 100 metres deep that overlie the sandstone and affect the hydrogeology, which is another whole new subject. And I have to put in this picture, which was again by David Pannett, of the moraines around the um, Montford Bridge area. Um, when you have very, very definite terminal moraine uh, around Melvilly, this is a Melvilly up to yeah. Nescliff, and another set of moraines around um, Montford Bridge through which the A5 ploughs, uh, and moraines the other side of the river with kettle holes around Bicton, where they're busy now. Building a whole lot of new houses uh, right around the kettle holes, ruining the glacial landscape, really. And here's another um, diagram, really, of the solid geology around Shropshire. And you'll see this deep, deep um, trough. There, there are two branches of it that meet around Montford and underlie the centre of Shrewsbury. So when they put in the, um, the new shopping parade in the middle of Shropshire, they had to put piles down many, many feet to reach bedrock in the middle of this trough. You wouldn't have a clue because the river meanders all over the place here. Um, and this trench carries on southeast of Shropshire, of Shrewsbury, all the way to Bilbrus, uh, all filled with glacial sands and gravel. So quite unstable land really. Um, right. And then, of course, lastly, the economic benefits to Shropshire of having all this glacial material really lie with the extractive industries for building materials. So here we have the Tudor Griffiths quarry at Wood Lane, busily um, extracting tons and tons of sand gravels. Likewise, the Hanson quarry at Condover, both in full production. Uh, for the growth industry of house building. Formerly, of course, there was peat extraction at um, Wixel Moss and probably in the Weald, uh, Weald Moors, now outlawed, of course. And of course, our rich ag agricultural soils of, uh, of, of Shropshire are enriched by this very varying um, the minerals that have been fed onto the land by the by the glaciers, so giving rise to the wonderful agricultural soils and the sandy areas where we can grow potatoes and asparagus and so forth. And last but not least, tourism, of course, as I said, beautiful countryside, which CPRE is doing its damnedest to to preserve. For some reason, Charles has put the three different logos of the CPRE since its formation in. When was it? Just a, 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 a nod to the passing of time. Sally's talked last time about 4.6 billion years of, of geology. This time it's been a mere 2 million years. CPRE has its own little short history. Um, as witnessed by these changing logos over, over the last sort of 40 years. 
So, so thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much, Sally. Um, once <laughs> it's again, longer than I thought. I thought it would be about an hour, but it's been an hour and a half. So it's absolutely it's fantastic. Very I'm fascinating. So we're asleep by now. No, we hope you enjoyed giving us that talk as much as we enjoyed listening to it. Um, okay. Just before we throw over to questions, um, just a reminder, if that you would like to hear more about our work and how to donate, how to get involved, please visit cpreshropshire.org.uk. You'll also note that I've put a, um, a, a sh very, very short survey of the chat. So if you if you can uh, click it now so you don't lose it when, when the... Um, a talk finishes and we'd really appreciate any feedback so i'll open the floor really to any questions i'm going to dangerously click uh ask all to unmute obviously only unmute yourself if you do have any questions i did put yeah. something on chat um i did I put a question not, on i hope it's not history Ripsia. please no no history no no it's about something you're talking about i want to know are we they got an awful lot of cobbles in our land. We're quite near the River Perry, but yeah. we also have a lot of large rocks locally that are found, and we do have some clay layers. And I was wondering, is, is ours moradic deposit, or is it from uh, the sediment from the river? Would that have called the cobbles? Well, of course, they, there will be fluvial terraces, but if they're quite big cobbles, I think it's quite likely. You're right by the River Perry, aren't you? We're, we're up a bit from it, but say we have got layers far. of clay as well. It's not very far. And there was another of these outwash channels, the, you know, the valley where it goes through by um, like the Leven towns. That is definitely a glacial outwash channel. Um, and a, the Perry further north, as you know, it's a great big sort of area of low marshy ground. So I would imagine a lot of rushing water came down through there, down through past right and eleven towns and dumped its sediments around you. Um, I'm, I'm sure these will be glacial and the clays as well. I think well, most certainly, the soils are. Certainly are lots of big boulders and fields. So Yes, um, yes. Well, these are all the erratics, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. And there are a lot of them. And everywhere you look around our area, is, it, there are erratics, almost every village because the farmers will have gathered them all up and dumped them in sort of strategic places as, as um, what our uncle used to call punctuation stones, Uncle Tom, you know, Tom Ward Green. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I think it, I would say certainly glacial is the answer to that. But, but we, there's always said that we're on the Wem fault. I don't, is that is that part of a glacial ah, thing? Or is that something ah, later? Now that's something totally different. Totally ah. different. Yes, <laughs> the Wem. Well, actually, that will have. I believe we have a hydrogeologist among our listeners, unless he's got bored and gone, which is quite likely. Um, and he'd probably tell you about that because these the the hydrogeology is determined a lot by these deep faults. Um, that, that, that strike through. There's one by the side of Nescliff Hill, which is probably the same one that you're on, extending up to northeast, uh, northeast from, and, and down past, over the river, near Melverley Bridge, north of Brighton, and then shoots down um, through, Shrop, through the Severn Valley. And that will have directed a lot of the hydrogeology of the area. But I don't think that these rocks you're talking about and cobbles can be anything to do with that. That's much older. Yeah, but uh, we have a lot. Of I plan to be corrected by any experts in the in the room, so to speak. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Fascinating talk. Thank you. Oh, Very thank interesting. You. I think yeah. we'll move to um, in a second, Jenny, and then Kath. Um, I'll just note a comment here from Martin Steer. We were to to Sally. Sally. We are not asleep. It was brilliant. Uh, Plato oh. geology, I love it. Thank you so much. <laughs> when is the book out? <laughs> who, who is this talk? Ma Martin Steer. Martin Steer. Do you know Martin? I don't know Martin Steer. I know Martin. Thank you, Martin Steer. How very nice of you. <laughs> very good. Can we it's go nice to, to Jenny, Jenny and Andrew then, please? Andrew. Jenny. Jenny, Jenny first, yes. Where's Jenny? No. No. Jenny, Andrew? No. Jenny's left us, I think. No. No, she's there. Um, okay, then, Kath, do you wish to ask your question now? You have to unmute. Mute. 
Yes, of course. If I yeah, yeah I think I um, I unmuted uh, because I thought everybody was unmuting, not because I had a particular question, but it was a very interesting talk anyway. Well, thank you. It was very interesting doing the research. I love doing these talks because it gives me such a wonderful excuse to defy all lockdown laws and any other laws that are going and just take myself off all over the county with my camera and discover all these wonderful places. And I should exhort everyone to go and look, particularly look around Condover. I had a wonderful time exploring Bowmere, if you know the Bowmere at Condover. So there's sort of a hidden kettle hole, which is actually a boating lake. And I gather the Shrewsbury School uses it for their rowing races, but it's sort of hidden in the, in the hills near Condover. And I then trespassed over into the Condover um, Hanson pit tearing my, my trousers to shreds in the process <clears throat> and walked along right round their diggings where they found those mammoths. Had a dreadful time getting out again, but actually it was a lovely walk and finding all sorts of amazing erratic rocks everywhere, these, that lump of granite particularly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so that's a wonderful place to go. Go and look at this esker because that's quite something. And of course, around Ellesmere, there's, there's all these wonderful places and bumpy, numpy, timpy, tumpies. Um, go and look at the Weald Moor, go and look at uh, Whitsell Moss, if you don't know it, but you probably do. Um, and, and just get your eye in and imagine what it was like when there was a, you know, a kilometre of ice above you, grinding away at the landscape. Oh, fascinating. But geology is, geology is unbelievably interesting, really. Yeah. Okay, next, please. <laughs> we have a question here from uh, New Homes Historian, which I believe is Steve. Hello, Steve. Good to see you or see from you. Um, I'll read out Steve's question if he can't unmute. Um, could you please tell me a little bit more uh, about the mighty Lake Lapworth? and its effect on the Ironbridge Gorge. How big was this lake? Ah, this is very controversial, and I hardly dare to say, but I think probably the geologists that promoted this are already in the hereafter. But this was long thought to be the reason why the Ironbridge Gorge existed. And it's well known, as I say, that a vast amount of meltwater developed a number of large lakes in the uh, you know, in the Weald Moor area and Shrop Shrewsbury area, um, and it's it was thought that these joined together and the pressure of the water got such and the height of the water that it overtopped uh, the coal um, above where Iron Bridge is now. But as I say the discovery of this deep, deep channel that extends from Melvilly to Bildwas and joins another channel that comes down where the River um, Perry is now, really where Zia's house is, um, that, that debunks the idea of the Lake Lapworth. And it's been found that these lakes were all at different levels, actually. So they couldn't all have been coincident on one, on one lake at any time. So that whole thing has been debunked. I think it's a bit of a mixture of both. I think there was a bit like Lake Missoula in Idaho that produced these incredible scab lands. I'm sure there were big lakes that disgorged, disgorged very quickly through the nascent Iron Bridge Gorge and deepened it and lengthened it all the way down to say Stourport through the Triassic sandstones. So I think it's a bit of a mixture, really, of, of reasons. But there certainly were a lot of big lakes. And you only have to look at the, the landscape now to see how much is very flat, where you might not expect it to be flat. And this is where these lakes were in the olden days. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any more questions before we draw to a close? If there are, please feel free to unmute yourself or raise your electronic hand if you know how to. <laughs> no? 
Oh. Can I just very quick one? That I know the Armbridge Gorge was affected early on, obviously it appeared there, but later on the river actually changed course. It was a huge volcano in 70, I'm trying to think what date it was, 17 something or other, and it moved the whole course of the river. Um, would volcanoes have affected other parts of Shropshire? Is there evidence that it's done that anywhere else? The whole course of the river, there were trees. Well, where there. was this volcano, dear? I'm fascinated. Uh, no, no there's a, there was a, a um, sorry, a, 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 a earthquake, not like, sorry, oh, earthquake. Earthquake. Oh, an earthquake. An earthquake. And I was wondering if earthquakes cause any other sort of disruption to rivers and things. In, is there evidence of that? It was, it was 1770s, I think it was. I don't, it I don't think I've heard of that. I, it's actually, all written, I've, I've got it all written up. It was um, because it's where they're going to do the building. The whole well, I know there are huge trees numbers moved across. Landslides, and aren't there? There are landslides. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to think what, what year it was. I was trying to do a quick search where I wrote to somebody about it, but I can't. Um, oh, here, ah. Um, I think I've got, oh, um, it's 27th of May, 1773. Oh, yeah, and as I, I've got, I've got an old, very old book that writes a whole um, eyewitness report of it, and houses and things, and whole oak trees moved down, and that river, the River Seven, changed its course. And I was wondering if there any other. This is news to me, but I, I mean, I'm ah. prepared to believe it. Ah. <laughs> I'm prepared to believe it, but uh, it was a, I have. It was a boundary. It's, so it's nothing to do with the Ice Age. So that's not my current. Area. No, it was by the birches, the river Seine, by the birches, a small bridge on the boundary of the Maidley Parish with build rust was destroyed. The whole River Seven stopped, it blocked the River Seven, and then it changed oh, really? oh, oh, it was really absolutely amazing. Martin's really just, um, Martin's just posted just, just, put, there we go. I've just Sorry. found a link, I've just found a link to it um, from the University of Nottingham, so I've posted it in the chat. I don't oh, know if lovely. You can see it. Oh, thank you. I just wonder if any other areas had similar things that changed the courses that would have muddled up the geology a bit and turned it upside down a bit. Well, I'm sure that has happened throughout throughout history. Yes, um, I mean, I was, I was a little bit fascinated by the the Wem Fault that you're talking about, which sort of parallels the river around the Melvilly area, and that might have actually moved that when that's that these some of these faults are still active um, as you know i mean we've had fault, we've had minor earthquakes within recent history haven't we there was one i think just before we moved up this to this area that we've knocked, had three here yes yes not chimney spots off but it's got to be a pretty big one to alter the course of a big river like the seven but i stand yeah. to be educated well, we have to read it up i got a fascinating book <laughs> perhaps you've given me my the um <laughs> the, the, the subject for next year's talk, perhaps um, earthquakes in Shropshire. How about that? <laughs> are, are there any more questions from anybody? Can we do a last call out. Yeah. No. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you again, Sally. Um, we oh. have been CPRE, the Countryside Charity. Take care. <laughs> yeah.